Hey there, check out this clip taken from my latest conversation with Deb Philman on the Engineering Politics Podcast, number 33, titled Engineering Reason. You can get the full episode on my YouTube channel, or even better yet, by subscribing to the Engineering Politics Locals community at engineeringpolitics.locals.com. And while you're on Locals, checking out all these wonderful independent creators, make sure to join Deb's community at thereasonwelearn.locals.com. All right, let's get to what you came for. Turn up the music. If I could uh, end this with a, a question that I asked you that I really liked your answer when I asked you, I think the last time we talked, if I may, yeah. Um, uh, the question kind of went, if, if you're a parent and you have problems with the school, do you think that every parent has the capability of homeschooling their kids if they prioritize it high enough? Now, I'm going to restrict this question to two parent households. I think one parent households have already kind of stepped back, whether it's you know, through their own actions or, you know, the death of a parent or something like that. Obviously there's externalities there, but um, do you think if, if uh, parents were to priori- prioritize it high enough, no matter what their, their conditions are at the time, do you think they'd have the ability to do that? Yeah. With your, all your caveats and everything and trying as hard as I can to be delicate so that people don't think I'm judging if they choose not to, because I am an individualist. And so you have freedom of choice. It's your, you know, you, you, you I'll choose. do the judging here. I'm the Catholic. I'll do the judging. Whatever. Judging. But I, if you're speaking strictly pragmatically, do, do people have the capability? Absolutely. Yes, you do. Um, it looks a lot different than people imagine. I think people hear the word homeschool and they picture, first of all, home. I think it has to happen physically in their dwelling. And then they hear school and they think it has to look or approximate school or schooling. And I think that's why I wish we had a different term for it, whether it's home-based learning, independent learning, um, you know, alternative education, come up with some other name rather than homeschool because it conjures up all kinds of, you know, on the one hand, it conjures up the Duggars and everybody's sitting around the kitchen table playing the violin and, you know, wearing clothes from the last century, whatever. It's, it's not that, it's you with your family sitting down and as you said, you know, prioritizing education under your own authority and your own design as one of the things that you place up there with choosing where to live or, you know, how to order your household or what job to take or any of the other decisions you make about your life and saying, okay, well, obviously job is really important. It's got to make a living, keep the roof over my head. So the hours I work are from here to here. The hours you work are from here to here. And then that leaves these hours that we have left. And what do we do in the summer for childcare? Okay, we do that. Is there any way to approximate that during the year? Let's see if we can like figure out something similar to what we do in the summer when the kid's not in school during the year. Is that possible? Are there other people in our community that are in the same boat we're in? Let's see if we can find them on Facebook. Social media has just made this so much easier. You know, look, oh my God, in my town, in my county, there are like 17 different homeschool groups of different varieties and religious, not religious, whatever. Oh, wow. I bet I could find a little community of people. So it it's you go about the process the same way you would, like I said, like a job hunt or a house hunt or something else, and you just sit down and prioritize it like that where it's going to work around your family. You don't try to fit into school hours. You're not trying to like organize it so that a room in your house is devoted to school room or something. You can do that, but you don't have to. I know people who are homeschooling in small pods in the inner city at night around day shifts that they work and, or somebody's working a night shift, somebody's working a day shift, or they both work day and the kid is with grandma or with an aunt or an uncle or a neighbor or whatever during the day. And during that day, they're re- having stories read to them, or they're just working on workbooks, or they're watching documentaries all day. They take away the screens for X amount of hours and they do, they, they want, you'd learn more watching quality documentaries in some cases than going to school. Okay. They surround them with books and then they say, when I get home at six o'clock or seven o'clock, we're going to spend half an hour, an hour, we're going to do some math that you can't do on your own or whatever. And that's the other thing. People think you got to spend eight hours schooling your kid because that's what they do at school. But I got news for you. They don't spend eight hours teaching your kid either. 
<laughs> if you distill mm -hmm. down, it's kind of like those people who go work in a cube. If they're honest with themselves, maybe they put in like three hours of actual work the whole day, maybe two. It's no different in a school. The rest of it is like, hurry up and wait, stand in a line, get into the da -da -da, work as a group, watch the teacher, sit on your Chromebook, try to sneak in text to your friends. Even in kindergarten, it's you're not spending eight hours doing things. It's mostly childcare, okay, by people who don't like your children and want them to be indoctrinated. But anyway, but if you look at it that way and you realize I really only, and it's and it's more hours the older they get, but guess what? The benefit is the older they get, the more they can self-serve. And it doesn't, you don't have to wait forever. My seven-year-old, my seven-year-old had a little box with her work that I put in there for her to do. So I could go off and do other stuff on the computer all day or whatever. And she would just go in there and be all proud of herself. That's her thing is little kids, seven and eight, they really like to be all self-sufficient. Most of them, they're like, my work, you know? And so it's, there's a great number of them that actually like being in charge of themselves. I have a harder time with my older kids, <laughs> believe it or not, they're fully capable. But after going back to public school for many years, I've had to like stick them with a coddle prod because school taught them to be lazy. They got such good mm -hmm. grades in public school with the dumbed down standards that they're like, uh, what? When they were little, Oh my goodness. I didn't have to do anything. It was like, here's the work. They self-serve. So uh, they were able to do school in like hour and a half, two hours a day. The rest of the time they played, they did whatever. My, my eldest daughter was reading at college level ability. I had to be very selective of books because they weren't appropriate, right? I ran out mm, of books yeah. that were like age appropriate. She could do that when she was eight years old. And it's not because I'm a genius or she's a genius. She just wasn't held back by any arbitrary limits of like, okay, now stop, stop. When she went into public school, they didn't have a reading level for her, obviously. So they made her tutor other kids. They made her read to other kids because they didn't know what to do with her. So, you know, anyone can do this. Or conversely, if you observe that your child is struggling early on, you can get in there with remediation. You can get in there and say, all right, we got to deal with this. I got to find out somebody who can help with a reading specialist. Maybe my child has dyslexia that you can do that, the school won't tell you because it's going to cost them money. And if you're not like watching and asking, watching and asking when they go, no, it's fine. That's fine. That's fine. If you don't push that and say, I'm, it's not fine. Do something. Mm -hmm. You're talking to be 10, 11 years old before you find out because you pulled them and sent them to somebody privately that your child has dyslexia and needs extra help. And by this point, the kid hates to read, hates school, is falling behind, feeling terrible about themselves. Worst case, their behavior problem. Because learning disabilities undiagnosed can cause behavior problems. But when you're doing it at home, you're, they can go at their pace. You can go at your pace. It's whatever you want it to be. So yes, if you prioritize this and you realize this is what they did for thousands of years. This is what they did till the 1880s in the United States. They didn't have a public school system. But they were all the racist. Nation. I don't know why. <laughs> Black but, children... Yeah had the same literacy rates as white children until public schools came into being. Yeah. Actually, they still did until desegregation. And now I'm going to say that and people go, oh, the reason we learn is pro-segregation. Hell no. Segregation is evil. But the one upside was they were protected from the low expectations of the public school that said, oh, no, no, you, because you, you have high expectations of your own kids, you know, when you're trying to protect your own kids. So- that's my answer. Yes, you can.